Hello, everybody, and thanks for being here to watch my talk about uh, mind control in JavaScript. So I know that uh, Phil just introduced me, so I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on me. Uh, but I'm just a, a developer, but what I think should be mentioned is that I'm not an expert in neurotechnology. So that might be a little bit of my imposter syndrome uh, talking right now, but I think it is important for two main reasons. Uh, once, it means that I started learning about all that stuff from scratch, uh, from really a beginner level. Uh, I don't have any background in neuroscience or not even in computer science, so um, Yes, I started from scratch, and uh, it means that I tried to explain everything in this talk in a very simple way, so it's accessible for everybody. And second, it also means that all the stuff that you're going to see in this talk, it means you can do it too. And that's one of the main uh, goal of my talk, is to show that everybody can actually uh, do that. You just have to kind of like want to learn, and all the resources are online. Um, so the slides are already um, online if you want to check them out, if, if I go too fast or if there's things that you can't see. But I will also uh, be sharing them on Twitter a bit later. Uh, I haven't actually started the talk, so you don't know if you're interested or not. Uh, so I will be sharing them a bit later. Don't worry about actually uh, writing them down. So let's, talk, let's start by talking about biosensing. So what is it? It is the use of sensors to monitor the activity of physiological functions. So you can have different types of sensors. You can have uh, heart sensors that you can buy, fingerprint sensors, muscle sensors, and uh, probably even more than that. I just put a few on them. And you can buy these sensors online, and you can make your own little device that you can then control in JavaScript. But you can buy devices that are pre-built. And the one I'm going to uh, talk a, a bit more about today is this brain sensor. That's called an emotive uh, epoch. But before talking about how the brain sensor itself works, I think we should take a step back and think about, um, like, start from how the brain actually works. So you have your brain, and uh, it's made of billions and billions of neurons. And what these neurons are, they are specialized cells that process information. But they're not randomly placed uh, around the brain. The brain we know is actually structured in different parts that are responsible for different functions as well. So if we take the example of moving your body, so motor functions, we know that as part of the frontal lobe that's at the front, one part of it is called the primary motor cortex, and the one at the back is uh, the cerebellum. So we know that activity in these parts of the brain are related to um, actions and movements. So what happens then is that neurons uh, trigger and, uh, like electrical signals and send their axons down, so axons are part of neurons, and they send their axons down the spinal cord that then connects to motor neurons that activate muscle. So every time something happens, it's just a bunch of uh, electrical signals all around the brain. And I'm just going to mention quickly a little bit, I don't know if you've seen that before, but it's called the cortical homunculus. And what it is, it, uh, it's a distorted uh, image of the human body based on how important uh, it is for the brain to process um, like sensory functions coming from these parts of the body. So as you can see, for example, processing information around sensory functions on the hand and the face are quite important for the brain. So when you want to build interfaces uh, that are related to movements of the hand or the face, then you have more of a chance to be able to uh, trigger that than if you try to focus on, on other parts. So this is not really important for that part of the talk, but it will be uh, a bit later. So when we talk about um, brain sensors, we talk about the fact that they track brain waves. And these waves have, um, they're part of like five different types that um, kind of function on different frequencies. So if you want to build an app around um, meditation, you will probably focus on the theta waves. Whereas if you want to be more around um, concentration and excitement and focus, you might want to look more about the, at the beta waves. And um, I actually forgot what else. Yes, so, how, so we track these brain waves, but then like, how do we actually track them? So how does the brain sensor work? This image is um, actually, the, it represents the 1020 international EEG system. So it shows where a uh, sensor should be placed around the head when you uh, decide, to, when you either buy a brain sensor when you, want, when you want to build your own. So you might not see because, well, it's not a great image, but each of the sensor has either a letter or um, a number, and it kind of represents where they should be uh, on the head and what they're actually tracking. And on green and orange is where the sensors are on the emotive brain sensor. So as you can see, there's a lot less of them. There's only 14. But 14 is still quite a lot compared to other brain sensors. And they're placed uh, quite like, they kind of cover a big part of, um, of the brain. And you can see that the letters are exactly the same, so you kind of know which part of the brain you're tracking. But what is interesting 
and why I'm here today, is because you can actually uh, interact with this brain sensor in JavaScript. So EpochJS is a node module that I have been working on for quite a few uh, years now, only because this is not something that I do at work. Uh, at work, I just build like normal websites, so I have to do that on my own time, and it only took me a lot of time because I don't always uh, have the time outside. But uh, it is working now. Uh, it is available. Everybody can use it. So what does it actually do? You have access to an emulator that you can download, so you don't have to actually buy the sensor to test uh, a program that you want to write. If you download the emulator, it's going to uh, emulate that the uh, sensor is connected properly on your head, and you're going to be able to send uh, actions to your program. And if you get the right feedback that you want, then it means that it should be working once the sensor is actually on. But you do have access to live data. So to start with, um, you have access to some data from the hardware. It's fi mixed up with my drone. Um, so you have access to uh, the gyroscope and accelerometer. So you have, if you're moving your head around, you're able to get the X and Y um, axis if you want to play with that. But you also have uh, performance metrics, so your level of focus and uh, excitement or other things. I just don't remember. Don't remember. There's more than that. But um, you also have access to facial expressions. So if you are smiling or blinking, looking right or looking left. And finally, you also have access to some mental comments. So you, when you download, when you start playing around with uh, the emotive, you have to download another one of their software where you train uh, your thoughts. So you have a list of about uh, 10 actions that you can uh, train. So for example, I'm going to take the first one, uh, push. So you select it, and then you think about pushing something for eight seconds. And it's going to record the, uh, the live data coming from your brain waves. And it's going to store that in a file so that if you uh, trained that, you know, train that thought a few times, you're able to replicate it. And if, it, um, if you can see the feedback on their interface, then it means you've trained it properly. Um, so in the background, the tech stack, uh, this is not the one that I'm going to talk about when I show the code samples later. But when I bought this sensor at first, uh, the only SDKs available were in Java and C++. Uh, my background is in like Ruby and JavaScript, so quite different. Uh, but I've had to write a very ugly C++ to make it work. Uh, but as long as it works right now, I'm happy with that. And uh, I then uh, used three node modules to create what we call a node add-on that allows me to then uh, do everything else in JavaScript. So if you are using EpochJS, you won't have to care about that. It's more if you are interested in creating a node, um, uh, node add-on for another device that doesn't have a JavaScript module. Oh, that part always comes too early. So um, <laughs> I. So now that we talked about what it can do, uh, I thought I would show it. Uh, so to start with, I need to always remind people that it doesn't always work. And uh, so I mean, live demos are always a risk. But when it's with hardware, it's even worse because you don't like sometimes you just don't know. Uh, you know, um, undefined is not a function, is not a thing with hardware. So OK. All right, so the first one, the first thing that I built, uh, I did a brain keyboard. So the concept behind that was to try to communicate uh, without really moving. So using the eye movements, so this one, this demo is not about the mental comments, it's about uh, facial expressions. So I have this uh, really quick prototype of a keyboard. And I want to be able to, when I look right, it highlights the letter on the right. When I look left, it goes back to the left. And when I blink, it should be able to select that letter. So now I need to set up the brain sensor because um, so what happens is that you have to put gel on all of the sensors. So I did that before coming here so I can see that they're quite set up. But just in case so I don't have to do it multiple times, I'll do it again, which means that I'm going to make a bit of a mess. But you know, uh, I'll clean it at lunch. Um, so. I think that's the reason why sometimes using the emulator is just easier, because you don't want to have to do that all the time. Um, it looks pretty all right, though. Uh, yeah, I tried it this morning in uh, my hotel room, and it didn't work as well as I wanted to, but they were very dry, and now I think it should be OK. Also, it connects via Bluetooth, so I just, OK, that's on. That's good. <laughs> OK, so all right. Mm -mm. Oh. OK, I need to put it on. Uh, at the moment, it's off, so well, nothing's going to happen. But um, OK, so I have them. I can really feel it. Um, OK, so I need to exit. I need to go to that. Um, oh, that's for later. Boop. Um, all right, so you don't need to see that, so I'm not going to zoom. But um, so first, I need to turn it on. That'd be good. 
Okay, I'm just going to check uh, quickly that it's, uh, I'm just checking the state of the sensors on the head. If it's all green, then it's fine. Oh, it's all right. Uh, ooh, no. Ooh, that's pretty good. Okay, so I'm pretty hopeful. Um, so if I do node server, I'm also shaking, which doesn't help. And if I create new one, oops. All right. And if I go right, now if I blink, oh, it's not working. Okay, that's a bit late. But oh, that's not really. What I oh well, it's a bit late. Not really what I want. To okay, so blinking has a bit of a delay. So as you can see, the first few letters I wanted to print hey, so it's not helping me right now. Uh, it's like, eh. um, yeah, current mood. Um, okay, well, great. So I mean, it is working, right? But uh, not exactly what I wanted to do. So fine, I'll just deal with it. Um, but as you can see, well, it's quite responsive with the movement of the eyes, but the blinking somehow, I had the same problem this morning, so I'm not quite sure what just happened here. Uh, but blink has a delay or it's not tracking it properly. The left and right are pretty fine. Uh, maybe you don't see my eyes, but I know it's pretty fine. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll stop with that one because uh, I need to move on to the others. And I'll close my server because I need to move on. So the second thing that I did, um, I built this. Um, so at first, it, I thought it would be a good idea to make it Tron-like. And now I'm like, oh my god, I'm so lame. So uh, I'm not a designer, so this doesn't look really great. I just wanted to, cry to, to create some kind of dashboard where I could see the state. And I wanted to be able to navigate a 3D space using my thoughts. So I didn't train all of them. What I'm going to try to do today is just thinking about uh, right and then left. Uh, the issue is that if I think about right and it triggers, then I see it going right, and all I have in mind is right. So I can't actually, I, I've, like it's really hard when you are in front of people to actually uh, manage to focus again. So again, this morning it worked, but I'm not in the same uh, environment right now. Um, and it, it always kind of, um, it, do, it doesn't really work great the first time, usually. Wait. So I'm going to have to be quiet. Yeah, OK. I can't go back left. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like, bye. Um, so you can train more stuff, you can do more stuff with it, it's just that, well, when it's a demo, I, I don't have, you know, uh, half an hour just for that demo. Um, so you could do more things, it was just a uh, first prototype, and I think what I wanted to test here is that could we, um, could we add uh, brain sensors into, like, a, a VR game, and could we interact uh, with it that way? So as you can see, it needs a little, quite a lot of focus, so I'm not sure that it would actually be a good application, but that was interesting. Uh, and finally, uh, as we are talking about JavaScript, uh, we can also play with hardware, because uh, JavaScript can now run on hardware. Uh, why not, you know? So this is, I'm going to show it with a drone just because it was easy to carry with me and it's a bit small, but it could be basically any little robot that, um, that has like a JavaScript API or a JavaScript module or something. So I also made it work with a Sphero robotic ball, but the thing is I know that on stage uh, not everybody can see, so I thought a drone would be a better idea. Actually, I'm actually not sure it's a better idea, but that's an idea. <laughs> Uh, so I need to turn on Bluetooth, and also I did something uh, stupid because while I was backstage, I uh, changed that demo because I thought it would be fun. Um, <laughs> it's also the one of the last time I'm giving this particular talk, so I thought, you know, let's spice it up. Um, so what um, I'm going to put it here in the middle. Uh, so the way it should work. What I usually do is I, I, don't, I don't do mental comments because, I, as you can see, it can take a bit of time. Uh, so I usually do if I look uh, left, I think it's left, uh, it should take off and then land. I don't think it's going to go that far. If it goes far, don't worry about catching it. Uh, it will just land. Um, now I need to remember what, uh, what do I need to do. Do I need to do that? Probably. Um, first, I need to check that it's, it needs to, OK, it's connected. So if I look left. OK. Oh, bye. <laughs> oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to crash because, oh, no. Oh. All right. 
Well, I don't have a comment to make it come back, so... Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but what I tried to do, also uh, backstage, and I'm, okay, I'm going to have to open uh, VS Code because I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but I wanted to try with the thoughts. I was like, let's do this. Okay, so this is horrible. This is horrible. Don't look at it. Ah. All right, so I'm going to comment that out. And what I did, okay, think about write. Okay, write kind of worked, so let's see if it works. I've never tried that before, so I don't know if it's going to work or not. <sighs> okay, so I'll do that. And I need to check that it's connecting. Connecting, yes, okay, so if I think right. Oh, fucking hell, shit. Oh, I thought left, but I want to think right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Well, then fuck it, I'm going to change it to left. <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> Wait, I want it to work, you know? Okay. Connect, connect, connect. Okay, so. No? I probably missed a, well, I probably missed something in the code. Uh, so this is not gonna work. Well, you, you can definitely not look at that. This is, so. I did, this is left, right? So. Oh, hee hee hee, it's me. Um, if I'm not sending it, then it's not going to... Okay. But left, I know, okay, left is working better, so you can do it now. Okay. Oh, now you... Are you serious? Okay, come on. Come on. I don't want to give up. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. It's not broken. Okay, so whew, I'm going to kind of now turn that off. Um, so yeah, whew, now I have gel over my hair, but you know, that's what you have to do. Okay, so um, code samples. How does it? How do you actually do stuff like that? So um, basically, in the server, that's like that's a sample, right? But that's kind of all you have to do. What you start by doing is you require the module, and then I expose two functions. There's either connect to live data, uh, where you give it the path to the file that was saved when you use their interface the first time to train your thoughts, or you have uh, connect to Invo Composer. So you have one or the other up to you. And then uh, when you connect to live data, you get an even object with different properties. And uh, each property either, either comes back as zero or one. Zero if it's not activated, or one if it is activated. And then I just send uh, an action via a WebSocket to the front end. Uh, if you're not dealing with the front end, you don't have to do that, but um, for the demos I did. And then in the front end, you just have a WebSocket uh, on, the port, on the same port that you're using, and when it gets a message from the server, you basically, depending on the, the message that it gets, so blinking or looking right, then you just uh, you do things. So uh, this is probably not the best way to uh, do it, but at the moment I just wanted to check that it was working. It could be totally refactored. I'm actually not saying that it's the uh, best code ever, um, but as I said, um, it does work, and I can just refactor it um, as it goes. So limits. So now that we can see a little bit what it does, there is a lot of limits, and I think they're quite um, important to talk about. So in terms of technology, you need training for each user, um, not for the facial expressions, but for the mental comments you do. And in a way, that's normal, uh, because we kind of all think differently. Uh, but that can be a bit of a limit for people to use that technology. Also, they say, um, I mean, they, ma they make you train it for eight seconds in their interface, but that's just the way they did it. I think the more you train it, the better it is. It doesn't have to be eight seconds. It's just if you use that one, it will probably have, eight uh, it probably have to be eight seconds. Uh, it can't track everything. So they give you 10 actions that you can track, and they are related to actions like movements, uh, because I think they're easier to focus on than uh, if you want to track something else. So I think if you had access to the raw data and you wanted to create, like, to track other actions, you might be able to. Uh, the thing is, if you actually, you, it has to be something that you can actually visualize in your mind. If you wanted to just um, think about abstract concepts like stress or fear, like you can't really reproduce that thought quite easily. Um, so like, yeah, it can't track everything. You have to actually have something that you can visualize in your mind. Uh, there's a little bit of latency. As you could see when I was trying to make my demo uh, work, it is, it, so it does take the live data constantly, but um, 
it has to, like, based on what you have recorded, it is trying to map your, the, your live data with any um, thing that it knows that you've, uh, that you've tracked. So it's trying to classify your thoughts. So there is going to be a little bit of latency, but um, depending on what you want to build, it might not be a problem. Uh, yeah, if you wanted to do like a thought-controlled car, that would be a problem. Um, and there's also the thing around uh, temporal versus spatial resolution, and that has to do with the different types of tracking brain waves. So if you look at a brain sensor like that, it has a really good temporal resolution because the data that you get back from the brain sensor, it comes back very uh, quickly. You get quite a lot of it. But spatially, uh, it doesn't cover the entire brain, so you can't track everything, and sometimes it's hard to filter through what's coming up. But if you look at other methods like uh, fMRI, for example, where you get, um, like when you scan your brain and you get images, spatially it's great because you see the entire brain, but temporally it's not great because you don't get the data as often uh, as you would like to, or as often as, um, you know, it can't be that efficient. So things get better, and that maybe uh, is going to be fixed in a few years, but at the moment it's still, uh, it's still not great. So there's limits in terms of technologies, but there's also limits in terms of uh, user experience. Uh, it looks pretty stupid. That's like one of the main uh, thing. Uh, like I think the main reason why people don't buy that kind of stuff, uh, apart from the fact that it's not always uh, performant, is the fact that in terms of social acceptance, working in the street with that on your head is not something that you would expect. Uh, so it could get better, you know. It's not comfortable after a few minutes. So if you think about how it's non-invasive, it still means that, the, so the sensors have to track brain waves through the skull, which is like, that's why you can't expect too much of it neither. But it means that the sensor has to apply a bit of pressure on your head to make sure that the sensor doesn't move too much and to make sure that the contact between the skull and the sensor is as good as possible. So after a few, um, after a few minutes, like, it starts to be a bit uncomfortable. Um, there's no real, I mean, there's no application solving a real need at the moment. Uh, so why would you go through, you know, the whole training? Uh, we have high expect uh, expectations as people, um, especially with technology. Now we kind of assume that it's going to work super great, uh, you know, as soon as you turn it on. And in a way, I think this is one of the things that is stopping us from having that kind of interactions. Uh, like, if, as you have to train it, would you really go through the training if you had to wear it the whole day or, or train it a hundred times? Like, that's a bit annoying. So I think there's something, uh, maybe as they get better, we'll have to train them a bit less, or as they get smaller, then we won't even feel them anymore. I think it's about trying to make the tech invisible in some way so that it becomes part of our, of our life. And there's also a difference between the mind and the brain. Like, what the sensor tracks is brain waves, it's just data, but it doesn't mean it's like it doesn't know exactly how your mind works or you know like your past experience in life like everybody is is different so you can get data but then it's going to like i think there has to be some relationship between the the person using it and and the device to be like oh i trained you to do this or i trained you to do that like it's not something that is going to work um out of the box right away uh, so I think one question that I would like to, like you don't have to answer right now, uh, but what would you do? Uh, when I usually ask people, I get answers like, oh, I would turn my light on or I would switch my channel on my TV. And I'm like, really? Like, is it what you would do if you had, would you really go through the process of training the brain sensor every single day, whereas the switch is right there? Um, so, if, I mean, if you... In terms of accessibility, yes, I totally understand that. But if we are talking about... Uh, like giving a function to like everybody to be able to use a brain sensor, I think we can go further than just thinking about um, turning a light on. I think turning a light on is usually like the first idea that comes to your mind, and I think that it would be really interesting to take a step back and think about how you live your life and think about how it would actually be really um, something that you would use. So I'm going to talk now about opportunities. So th these are just some of my ideas about how uh, it could be used. So first of all, I mentioned accessibility, and this is one of the reasons why I built my first demo around the brain keyboard. Um, it's like being able to allow people with some disability to actually still live an independent life and able, being able to, to communicate or to do things without the need um, to have somebody else present. So I think there's really something to do here, but not only. So in terms of mental health, you do have some brain sensors that are more specified around training you to meditate better. And I don't know if you've ever tried to meditate, but I find it really hard. And you don't really know if you're doing it well or not. So if you actually use a brain sensor, you would have direct feedback about how you're doing around your meditation. Are you like calming down or are you focusing? And that could be quite interesting. Uh, in terms of prevention, I really hope that in some ways we could use brain sensors to prevent things like uh, anxiety attacks or um, 
uh, strokes or even uh, epilepsy. So that would be really uh, awesome because I'm pretty sure, I mean, well, again, I'm not a doctor, so I wouldn't know. But uh, I think that if, you, if people were wearing uh, a brain sensor kind of regularly, you should probably be able to see some patterns that happen before uh, a stroke happens or before uh, a, like an epilepsy um, crisis happens or something, and you would be able to prevent it, which I think would be really awesome. In terms of productivity, I think what would be interesting is if we were wearing uh, that type of stuff regularly, we could then create a map of how our days usually go. There's probably moments of the day where we are more uh, focused than others, and others where we kind of like switch off and we're not that focused. And we could actually use that to maybe even uh, remap how we go through our day based on, based on when we are the most focused. Um, but that, as I said, that would mean wearing the brain sensor often enough for it to be able to create that kind of map. Um, and last but not least, um, art. And this is one of my favorites, and I know that usually it's a bit hard to uh, make people understand that art actually has a value. Uh, I have actually seen more artists play with brain sensors than developers. And I think one of the main reasons is that when you try to build something that is a bit more creative without really uh, a value, it allows you to explore technologies in ways that you wouldn't do um, at work. And I know that when I started playing with brain sensors, I definitely didn't want to I didn't even think about uh, like a platform to communicate with your eyes. What I wanted to do was, uh, I think I wanted to uh, listen to songs and get my brain data and visualize it, which is like, like useless, right? But uh, the thing is, as I explored to try to make that, I actually never ended up making that. But um, as I tried, as I started exploring uh, neurotechnology and brain sensors and trying to build things like that, I then understood the potential and what could actually uh, be done. So what I usually try to tell people is that a useless is not worthless. Uh, most of the time, people don't actually even explore new technologies because they want something, they want a valuable idea straight away, and they end up doing nothing, uh, which is a real shame. I think that we could have, uh, that, that's why we can't have nice things, you know? Like, we need, like, I think just, exploring technology would actually allow us to probably have better devices than we have now. I think another possibility that would be really interesting is to combine a brain sensor with other sensors. When you think about the brain uh, itself, it only perceives the world through other parts of your body. Like without the eyes, the brain doesn't see, without the ears, uh, we don't hear. And I think thinking about the brain sensor independently is a bit of a mistake because, well, you might see when you're more stressed, but you don't know why. Uh, like nothing else gives you the feedback about why, uh, why you're stressed or, or when you're, I, I don't know, well, I'm going to move on because I don't have an example. But uh, if, you <laughs> like if you were adding a few more sensors, you would probably have a better um, contextual understanding of why you're reacting a certain way. And I think it would probably help us build better um, interfaces. The only issue is that then you would probably look like that. Uh, so this is true. This is like, I saw that last night. I was like, oh my God, are you for real? Um, so this is a company called uh, Cognionix. And they do brain sensors. Uh, that's the, yeah, the thing on the head. And uh, they also connect to other sensors. So I think, well, one is probably uh, like heart sensor and muscle sensors. And well, I think like as not really, like I wouldn't wear that but I understand why it would be uh, important. And I'm actually glad to see that. I think it's the only uh, company that does brain sensors that I actually see also connecting other devices to it. And I really think that there is something um, to that. So what is next? I actually don't, have, don't know how much time I have. But um, so there is another thing I wanted to build that's called the P300 Speller. And what it does, I'm not going to explain exactly uh, the tech behind it, but it's basically allowing to communicate. And instead of using the movement of the eyes, it actually does use uh, mental comments. You have this grid of letters, and they light up at different uh, times. And when you focus on a certain letter, it counts how many times. Like there's a peak in certain brain waves that, that happen, and they're able to figure out which letter you're thinking of. Uh, there is somebody did build that for the emotive, but when I tried to uh, play with it, it didn't work. So I'm not sure if it's me or them. Uh, but there is, it is something that I'm quite interested to try. But I also bought this one. So this, I didn't bring it with me because it's huge and I haven't had the time to play with it, but it's called the OpenBCI, and it's totally open source. So you get the raw data, you, in a way it's good because as you get the raw data, you build your own uh, machine learning algorithm, you do the whole data processing yourself, uh, but it's also one of the bad parts. Like it is uh, a bit more intense. If you want to get started with that, I probably wouldn't recommend the OpenBCI, but as you go and explore, uh, having access to the raw data and making exactly what you want is pretty cool. Uh, I tried it a few weeks ago. I just had the time to put it together and try one of the uh, very basic stuff. 
that is basically when you close your eyes, you should see a, a peak in certain waves. And uh, as you can hopefully see, when I close my eyes, you can see uh, the peak, so it means that it's working properly. I just haven't had the time at all uh, to do anything else with it. I think I bought the one with uh, 16 channels, so you only see eight because I tried to filter them so that you could see, uh, but there's uh, 16 channels. So as you can see, it's a lot bigger. And it's also quite heavy on the head. Um, and it doesn't use gel. Actually, each of the sensors have some kind of like spikes. So it does hurt after a few minutes. Like, it actually does hurt. So uh, I need to try it a bit again. But yeah, as it's quite heavy, it's all 3D printed. The weight of it, when you take it off, you do have little holes in your head. Um, so, but I mean, like, well, well, I'll do it for science. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, I'm really excited to try that. Um, it's just a bit hard to, to carry and things like that, uh, but it's really exciting. And what I want to do with it, oh my god. So uh, this is a deep image reconstruction. And what this is, uh, so you have the video footage on the left. And so you're watching the video. And your brain waves are recorded while you're watching the video. And on the right, you have the reconstruction of these uh, videos based on your brain waves. Um, so you have to keep being, you have to keep watching it. You can't just think about the image, not at the moment. They're still working on that. Uh, but yes, so you have to keep watching the video, and it can be transmitted to like another screen. So a person in another room could actually uh, kind of know what you're watching. So as you can see, it's still a bit blurry, uh, but they just discovered that, that they could do that. So it is going to get better as sensors and machine learning algorithms get better. Uh, but it is pretty exciting because what I mean, my, the first thing I was thinking of is that you could record your dreams and you could like wake up in the morning and be like, oh, what did I dream of last night? And like watch the stuff, like that's pretty cool. And another level is that they're trying to do that without watching the video anymore. Uh, so for example, you could have images of letters and you could look at them and you could uh, record the brainwaves uh, while, you, while you're looking at them. And then when you think about a letter, you could try to reproduce it in another screen. Um, so that is really cool. Uh, it's like very much at the beginning of it, uh, but I think it would be, that would be true like mind control. Uh, but there's other interactions. So this is sometimes, as you can see, there's a lot of limits. Um, not everybody can buy a brain sensor. And I just like to think about other interactions, because when you think about the phone or the laptop, I find it very restrictive. Like We've had to learn how to use this rather than it adapting to us. So I just wanted to speak, uh, to talk a little bit about, like, quickly uh, about other interactions that you can actually have. So using sensors as output. So this looks huge, but the concept is, I think a team at Facebook is working on that, where instead of just getting data to the sensor and then doing with it, the sensor would be the, uh, the output. So this is talking about vibrations on the skin. So you would be wearing something, and I think one of the articles was about being able to uh, read your emails in your arms or something. So you would be wearing uh, a device, not like that hopefully, but you would be wearing uh, something and you would have to just train yourself to understand vibrations. So um, I think, yeah, they're just like, so it would vibrate a certain way for uh, certain letters, so you would just have to train yourself a little bit to understand uh, what a word, what kind of vibration a word would be, and then you would be able to uh, read stuff just by vibrating on your, on your arm, so you wouldn't need any screen anymore. So I think they had an experiment where, so, uh, so that you had two people, and one person had an iPad, with things uh, that he could um, click on. So for example, there were just really simple examples. It was like uh, blue cube or white cube and blue triangle and white triangle. And the person on the, on the other side uh, didn't know at all what, like they, the person knew the different options, but they didn't know the one that would be picked. Uh, so the person would click on like blue cube and on the other side, the girl was wearing the sensor and she was like blue cube, just because she, uh, learned to understand the vibrations uh, that were mapped to certain words. So, um, in a way, maybe you're like, oh, you know, I don't care about this. But when you think about it, we're actually kind of doing it already. If you have a smartwatch, it does vibrate when you have a message or when you have a call. And you, like, it doesn't vibrate in a way that you'll understand what's in the call, but you can still already make the difference between a call or a text message, or sometimes some apps vibrate in a different way, so you know if it's a notification from uh, Twitter or a Snapchat or something. So, and it's not something that we were born with. We have actually uh, learned to understand uh, vibrations, and so not in a very deep level as reading an email, but you kind of still already have that um, sensors as output kind of thing. Uh, 
projections, I find that example really cool, but it actually was 10 years ago and we still have nothing like that. So it's based on uh, a talk called uh, Meet the Sixth Sense Interaction, and that was a TED talk, and it was a project where you can see the prototype on the right, where you are wearing a necklace with a camera and a projector, and uh, it, like, it runs like computer vision, so the person has little uh, colored stickers on the finger. So you could pick up objects and have um, information projected on top of it. So as you can see, you could pick up uh, a newspaper, and instead of having just a picture, you know, just like in Harry Potter, you would, have, um, you would have a video. And when you think about it, 10 years ago, I understand that that was a bit big, right? But now, we could have probably built something way smaller than that, that would just look like any normal necklace but we haven't. Um, and I mean, that's a shame because when you think about augmented reality, we build these massive glasses that nobody would wear, but if it's, it can be, like, it is augmented reality, but as a necklace, and you could have really uh, useful, like, Applications, for example, like I think one of the things that they were showing is that you could go to the shops and you could pick up um, you could pick up something and it would recognize exactly what it is and the expiration date and whatever the ingredients are. And maybe this is not something that you want to do, but if you think about uh, people who are uh, who have vision impairment. When you pick something in your fridge, you might not know exactly what it is, you might not know, or if you go to the shops, you might not know the expiration, like the expiration date, yeah? Uh, and, but if you have this kind of device, it could actually look at what you're using and give you a feedback, like either it would have speakers or you would connect it to your phone and um, with earphones, and like, you, like there are things that are useful that actually are way more doable than interacting with your brain. And unfortunately, we haven't done anything with it. Uh, this one is like something that I'm really uh, excited about. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, it's called Project Alter Ego. It's, uh, it's a prototype built by a few students at MIT, and what they've built is this wearable that you wear on your jaw, and what it can sense is the vibration that, um, or like the electrical signals that go to your jaw when you have silent speech. So before talking, so if you want to talk but you don't vocalize it, you still have electrical, you still have triggers in the jaw that you can actually track and then map to certain words or certain letters. So. Um, like, yeah, basically you would think, you would train, like same, you would have to train it because you'd have to use uh, machine learning to filter out through all the electrical signals and then make sense of certain words. But there was an interview where um, this guy, I totally forgot his name, uh, he was showing how he was Googling things just by, uh, like, thinking about it. So when you think about a word, uh, electrical signals filtered through the jaw and then it would map it to certain words. So, yeah, that is, that is pretty cool as well, and that's... Um, I see it working a bit better than having to use a brain sensor because what you need is um, electrodes. So not everybody has electrodes at home, but um, I do, and I want to try to I want to try to replicate that. So I'm not an MIT student uh, again. I don't know if I'll get there, but I think it's quite um, it's quite interesting that you can try. If you have electrodes, you get data, and you have to play with machine learning to try and make sense of it. Uh, this is called uh, ultra haptics, and what it is is just haptic feedback from this. Um, uh, white box here. I'm not going to explain exactly how uh, haptic feedback works, but what it does is you can place your hand over that device, and basically the circle that you see here, uh, it doesn't exist. Like, it's just basically, like, I don't know if it's vibration or air or whatever. I don't really know exactly how they do that, but it's, you're, you're able to feel shapes without actually having anything there. And what they want to do with it is to play with, um, to be in VR, and to be able, if you want to grab a cube in VR, you would actually feel the cube, but it's not there. Um, so again, I'm not going to go too much in details because I don't have the technical knowledge about how it actually works, but it is another form of interaction that people um, are building at the moment as well. I remember getting in, in contact with them because I wanted to try it, and they told me that it was uh, $20,000. So I was like, bye. Um, <laughs> So I think as it goes, it will probably get a bit cheaper, but that's really uh, interesting as a way to interact with things. You wouldn't have to touch them. They would just, like, you would feel them, yeah. Um, this is another one that you might have seen as well, uh, Project Soli by Google, where they used um, sensors to track micro-movements. Uh, so that uses machine learning as well, but basically, in, in, like instead of having to touch stuff, it would recognize really, really small uh, movements by, like, with the hand, and you could hide that into uh, devices and then have that kind of other types of, um, of interaction. And what would be amazing is if you can 
track it with your own um, gestures. So you wouldn't have, uh, hopefully, you wouldn't have to just learn the way they want to turn the volume up. You would just kind of create your own uh, things. And this is not that far neither. I think they released uh, a dev kit, but it was really uh, for a certain number of people. I didn't get to have one, unfortunately. So uh, I tried to build my own. And I'm not there yet because I don't have the time. But uh, I, like, I bought a sensor that um, kind of tracks micro movements. And all I have to do, I mean, all I have to do now, uh, it's uh, you have to do, from what I understand, uh, radar signal transformation. So it's kind of like, it, it is like a space that I don't know anything about. Uh, but it is exciting, like thinking about other ways to interact with things than the normal stuff that we do. And finally, I don't know if you've seen this one recently as well by a company called Control Labs, where there is this sensor uh, on the arm here, and the person is not moving, but they've managed to filter uh, the, the, like the electrical signals that come all the way down to the arm to represent small movements. So when I showed you the map of the uh, cortical homunculus at the beginning, uh, and I said that the hands are quite important in the way the brain processes information, I think um, instead of having to wear a brain sensor where you get so many different types of information, if you put a sensor towards the end of what you actually want to track, then it's already filtered for you, because what you get around the arm are signals to move the arm. It's not signals to speak, for example. Um, so yeah, th so they started building that. It's still a prototype, but it's really uh, exciting in terms of things that you could do when you think about prosthetics. Uh, you could really control them, not only you know, open or close, but you could try to control them in, in more natural uh, ways, which is really exciting. And as it uses an armband, uh, I tried. Uh, but what I built was really, uh, I just built that. So um, <laughs> that is, so as you can see, it doesn't work the same as well. But it's like this, is, like I, it's a sensor that's called the Mayo armband. Um, I thought you could still buy it online, but I checked the website and uh, maybe they went bankrupt or something. But um, I think maybe on eBay you can still buy one. And they, you, usually you train it with certain actions, like left and, and right and things like that. Uh, but it's only pretty fine functions. But they, they, do, um, give, they do let you have access to raw data. So you can get that data and then play with machine learning and try to uh, create your own gestures, which is what I did. At the moment, it's just neutral and, uh, well, fuck you. But um, this is, uh, later on, I want to try more personalized gestures. And I want to see if eventually you could have uh, understanding of, of sign language with different armbands. Uh, um, so that would be quite interesting. I don't know if I'll get there, but I like to explore with that cap, uh, type of stuff. Uh, so getting started. Let's get back to brain sensors. Uh, there are other brain sensors that you can buy. Uh, these ones are like the cheaper ones. The one on the bottom right, I uh, think, I'm not sure that they still, um, that they still sell it. Uh, when I started playing with that, I didn't start with the Emotive at all. I started with the NeuroSky because I didn't know uh, it was like 10 times cheaper. And I didn't know if, uh, what it could do, and I didn't know if I could do it because I didn't have the knowledge. And then I slowly uh, bought more performant devices. But the Muse one is, uh, is the one that is more around meditation. Uh, but you do get raw data straight away out of the Muse. So I think it, uh, if you want to get started with that, I would probably recommend to try uh, the Muse. I don't have one, but I think it's, uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, and as I said, again, you know, I go back to the beginning, but there are other sensors that you can play with. It doesn't have to be brain sensors. And uh, that might look a bit scary, but it's actually not that scary at all. You have a lot of tutorial about how to build your own things, and you can do it in JavaScript. So that is really cool. Uh, I just have a few resources. If you are interested in learning more, uh, there are frameworks for the OpenBCI and the uh, Epoch uh, and the Emotive Epoch. So, um, yeah, so there's a few things that you can try. I just put some uh, useful links around different SDKs that you can see, or there's also a global Slack channel called uh, Neurotech X. If you are interested in neurotechnology, uh, they usually share uh, articles and videos, and you can uh, ask people questions if you, if you want to. And finally, I just wanted to uh, put the few names of, uh, of a few people who do that. I'm obviously not, uh, not the only one, and this is probably not a full list, but it's only the people I could think of. So if you are interested in learning more, you could also check out uh, their work. And one of the main things that I wanted to say is that, yes, you don't have to be uh, an expert to get started. And the reason why I'm saying that is because a few, uh, few days ago, my uh, dad sent me an email with an, uh, an article that he saw in a, in a magazine uh, with a woman in France who has um, a startup in uh, neurotechnology. And he was like, do you know her? I was like, no, I don't know everybody. Uh, but it, well, I read the article. And um, what I didn't really like is that they focused a lot on the fact that she uh, got her first computer at seven, and her dad was like a neuroscientist. So she already all, uh, like had all that background. And like honestly, she I think she got her PhD at 25. So honestly, like good for her. But the thing is. Um, 
I think when we show things that way, it really pushes other people to even uh, try. And that's what really like, um, kind of annoyed me. Uh, of course, like, I'm sure that this girl is, is super smart, and she's uh, like, only 26, and she has a startup, and like, she's killing it. But you don't have to have that to get started. And uh, yeah, that's why it annoys me when you can see in the media, they portray everybody as like geniuses. And they're smart, yes, but it is available to other people as well. So that's one of my uh, main points that I wanted to talk about. Um, so that's it. Uh, we'll set you free to have lunch now. Uh, but if you have any question, I will be around or I, uh, I, I, like I check my message on, on, on Twitter if you don't want to talk to me face to face. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Cold Front, for having me. And thanks, everybody. Amazing. Amazing.